Brittany Vischer will lead off the discussion on, the, on maximizing hyperpotential with the focus on club root. Brittany is the research director for Alberta Canola. And this past summer, Brittany obtained her master's degree from the University of Alberta with a thesis focused on club root management. Here's Brittany. Awesome. All's good? Cool. So good morning, everyone. As I introduce myself, my name is Brittany Fisher, and I'm the research director for Canola. And today, just getting my club root fix and speaking on maximizing your hybrid potential with club root resistant cultivars. So to start off, uh, this is a prairie wide discussion. So I want to, um, let's just get in my back. I just want to do a very quick overview of club root disease uh, as not everyone is on the same familiarity of club root disease. And so there's 3,700 species in the Brassicaceae family that are susceptible to Plasmodia brass, Plasmodiophora brassicae, which is uh, the pathogen that causes club root disease. And it's not new. It was seen on cruciferous vegetables in Canada in the 20s and then on oilseed uh, crops in the 60s and 90s. But it wasn't until 2003 that we saw it on canola in Western Canada. So in 2009, we uh, developed our first cover resistant cultivar that was commercially available. And I'll repeat this again later on, but the genetic basis of most clubber resistant canola cult cultivars are not disclosed. So we do assume that the first batch uh, or first generation of clubber resistant cultivars uh, are of the genetic basis with Mendel, which is a European winter rape seed cultivar. And it has a single dominant clubber resistant gene. And so as those came out, those first generation pathotypes, or sorry, cultivars, we had resistance to pathotypes two, three, five, six, and eight. However, with major gene resistance, uh, we, we often see shifts in the pathogen populations. And so in 2013, we uh, saw significant club root symptoms on club root resistant uh, varieties. And when we isolated that pathotype, it was still identifying as five. However, it could overcome that first generation resistance. So we, the Canadian researchers thought we needed to create our own differentiating system to increase our capabilities of identifying them. Um, we initially named this one as 5X, which many people probably heard of uh, when it was first discovered because we were very worried about it. Uh, but we have since discovered many different pathotypes within Canada. And I could talk for quite a few minutes on the CCD set, but that's not the point. Uh, what I wanted to uh, bring your guys' attention to is at the bottom, those pathotypes two, three, five, six, and eight have now been identified and a letter has been attached to them as 2F, 3H, 5I, 6M, and 8N. And that is how they're, they're identified on the CCD or the Canadian Clever Differential Set. Also, when you see that, uh, I, for all the seed companies I looked at, they do a good job identifying that and attaching that letter. But say if you see something that is resistant to, to five, it doesn't mean that it's resistant to all the pathotypes starting with the number five, it's specifically referring to 5i, for example. And that goes for any two, three, six, or eight uh, pathotypes. We want to make sure we always have a number and a letter associated with them. So uh, with that breakdown, clipper resistant breakdown is uh, quite a misleading term because we don't actually have any breakdown of the genetics itself. Rather, we're just suppressing those specific pathotypes and allowing others to increase. So when we look at the Mendel resistance, uh, this is actually new updated information. Uh, so like I said, unofficially referred to as the first generation cultivars. Uh, Mendel resistant is actually resistant to 18 different pathotypes. So it has a very robust resistance package. Uh, we did add a new pathotype from 2019 and 2020. Uh, however, we did add six more breaking pathotypes or or pathotypes that um, can overcome Mendel resistance. And so, uh, yeah, seven new pathotypes discovered in 2019 and 2020. So that brings our total to 51 pathotypes that have been identified with the Canadian Club Root Differential Set. Uh, and unfortunately, I don't have this for province-wide, but specifically within Alberta, we have 321 fields now with confirmed erosion or breakdown. 
So we look at second generation or next generation CR3 multigenetic second, whatever you want to call it. Uh, what it is, it contains club root resistance that is different from or in addition to Mendel. And so the genetic basis, like I said before, it's not disclosed. So I, I list some examples at the bottom to show you how complicated it can get. So CS2000 is a Cantera variety and it has the what we assume to be the Mendel genetic basis, and it has immediate uh, intermediate resistance to 5X, 3O, and 5K. Their other clever resistant variety, CS2600, is also resistant to Mendel with 2, 2B, 5X, 3A, and 3D. So just within one company, they have different resistance, and these are both um, coined as second generation resistance, but both different. Whereas we move into the Bravant 3010M, it has what we see or what it appears to be a similar resistance package to CS2600, but we don't know the exact genetic background uh, and where they source these resistance from. And so we don't know if they have different resistant genes or if they're stacked. Uh, so unfortunately, we just can't confirm whether the source of genetic resistance is the same or not. And that's where second generation gets complicated in uh, referring or recommending them. So what I want everyone to uh, gather from this is that second generation does not automatically mean that it's better. Uh, and especially, it's not a black and white, it's better for every situation or not. Uh, it really depends on your, the, the specific field and your management practices. And then also within that field, what is the predominant pathotype? And how are, you, how are you managing so that we don't have spore buildup? And so this is a pretty aggressive or uh, chart. Um, it's quite complicated, but I did add some little cheat notes there on the right-hand side. And so these are 23 different field samples. The galls were collected uh, from the clever resistant cultivars, uh, nine novel pathotypes were distinguished, and then these are cumulative index of disease percentage. So not against one specific pathotype, but a cumulative. And this is just preliminary results. And so um, Keisha Holman will then go back and also test them against single spore isolates of 3H and 3H. Because two appear to be quite susceptible to the old and previously dominant pathotype 3H. Uh, however, that could just be because they have a different resistance uh, background. So we need to grow clubber resistant cultivars. And that might seem a little bit contradictory to what I've been saying but we need to be proactive and we need to incorporate it into an integrated management plan because we need to keep spores low and I'll show you why. So these are just screenshots taken from the life cycle of club root. Uh, and so we look at the canola root, zoom into the root hairs and even further that root hairs to the left-hand side, your P brass K4 uh, has those flagellas and will then eventually penetrate uh, the, the root hair. And so if we have a Mendel resistance background and we have a breaking pathotype, uh, this one is actually able to penetrate the root hair. And so on the left-hand side, if we just take that root hair and turn it 90 degrees, it's on the base now going horizontally, uh, the P. brassicase 4 can penetrate um, a Mendel covert resistant cultivar if the pathotype is 3A, whereas the 3H um, has some resistance to it. Now, clever resistant cultivars are not 100% resistant to clever. Uh, the way that they get registered is if they're less than 30% infection compared to the successful checks in disease tests. And so in this image, you can see that uh, this plant that is resistant has Mendel resistance background. Uh, the 3A plasmodium there, you can see that in the image, but also the 8N, 3H, and 5I can also infect the plant just to a lesser degree. And so gall is comprised of many different pathotypes, but 3A can infect and replicate at a much higher rate than the other pathotypes due to the plant resistance. And so when this gram, um, sorry, when this gall decomposes, it releases billions of spores into the soil and that gram of gall can release around 16 billion, one gram of gall can release up to 16 billion resting spores. And so we have to prevent these large galls from forming and ultimately releasing spores into our soil because, and this is a shameless plug from my research, uh, looking at what is the most effective tool to manage club root? It, of course, is genetic resistance. And so we need to make sure that we manage this tool appropriately so we have it for the long-term plan. And so I don't, uh, I think 
club root disease is a very is very manageable, but we need to be proactive of it, which is why we need to grow club root resistant cultivars before we have a problem with club root. And when I say in an integrated management uh, plan, this is what I mean. Keep spores low, keep spores local, and then managing those patches. Depending on where you farm, you may implement all summer, none of these management strategies. But like I said, it's quite manageable and we need to be proactive. There was a, a, a very, uh, Canola Watch put out a, a good survey on just questioning farmers, what they do uh, to manage club root appropriately. And so prairie wide 50% have a crop rotation of at least two year break. Uh, and this is just to decrease the resting spores by 90% as research has shown. We need to be proactive and scout, not just scout when we have a problem and you can see it above ground. We need to grow clever resistant cultivars and then also control brassica weeds. And that includes, I should, I should list them out, stinkweed, flickweed, shepherd's purse and mustard. Biosecurity remains to be the most effective tool at managing um, or, or preventing the movement of spores. However, it's a three-step process and it is not practical or realistic between every field during the busy season. About a 12 meter cultivator takes over four hours to complete those three steps. And so we need to be uh, mindful of where the equipment is coming from, maybe taking that three step if you're buying a new piece of equipment or, um, or sorry, and, making sure we're knocking out those big clumps of soil, leaving wet fields because 10 spores can fit across the width of your hair. So there's a ton of spores um, that are in big clumps of soil. And then also reducing tillage. There wasn't this uh, survey put out for uh, patch management, but I was procrastinating writing my thesis and I did put out a survey, very official survey on Twitter. And we have 71% of people who find a patch of club roots um, that aren't pulling it or applying the soil amendment, in addition to 72% um, of it not people not seeding it to grass or marking it off. And so in my perfect world recommendation, I would love people to make almost like a metaphorical rock on that, on that patch of club root and uh, seed it to, um, you know, apply some soil, and then apply a soil amendment, seed it to grass and mark it off so that we completely avoid uh, disturbing that patch of club root and really allowing that spore load to decrease. So with that, I'm not sure if I've gone over time, but we wanna make sure that uh, we continue or, or we get club root resistance in that field. It's the most effective way to keep spores low. And uh, again, it's, very, it's a very manageable disease, but we need to be integrative and proactive uh, to continually grow uh, canola. So. Right on. Thanks, Brittany.